called Promoting Participation in Small and Medium-Sized Towns, Experiences, Plans, and Innovation. 
Uh, our first presenter is uh, Christina Kantler from the municipality of Bebra in Germany. Thank you very much. I promised Will to wake you up this morning. <laughs> and we have a battle cry in Bebra. It's called Beba Wasser, Beba Wasser, hoi, hoi, hoi. And now together, <laughs> Beba Wasser, Beba Wasser, hoi, hoi, hoi. So I think you'll wake up now. And <laughs> <laughs> This is my presentation or our presentation, Barriers for People with a Migration Background in Relation to Political Participation of Smyrna Municipalities Experiences from Bipra. <clears throat> the structure is Bipra. Uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> short portrait. The immigration history of Bipra since 1960, statistics barriers on the way to the political participation and the conclusion. Bebra is situated in the middle of Germany, in the heart of Germany, near to the former inner German border, the east-west German border. It belongs to the country as Rotenburg in the state of Hesse. Bebra is divided into the four city and 11 districts with 40,247 inhabitants. 8,257 people, 58% live in the core city and 5,990, 42% in the districts. Here you can see the core city and the districts, how they lie around the ground. The immigration history of people since 1960, the economic growth of people of Germany needed new workers. Everybody knows this. Workers from Italy, Spain, and Turkey came to Germany. It was not planned to integrate them into society because they were meant to leave Germany, leave Bipra within several years. Also in Bipra, there was no planned integration. Fortunately, a few resistance showed voluntary commitment. In Bipra, we had a lot of people from Spain and Turkey. 1980 to 2000, job seekers and asylum seekers from Turkey, uh, most of them were Orthodox Christians, Ar Aramean people, Afghanistan and ex Yugoslavia came to Bipra, as well as Germans from the former Soviet Union. 2014 till today, Bepa received refugees from Syria, Eritrea, Afghanistan, and so on. The infrastructure for integration was further developed. Germany is better prepared now. Professional and civil commitment support and accolade the process of integration. Already existing structures, the communities of migrants are pillars of integration work. We have a lot of communities uh, in Bepa, and they welcome, they Yes, take them on the hand and show them everything, and so it's now better. 2022 till today, refugees from Ukraine came to Bibra. Mostly they find support by their relatives. The city of Bibra set up an assistance fund and supports the integration work of the churches. Today, 2,248 people from 74 different nations live in Bebra. Foreigners and Germans with immigration history is more than 25%. We have classes at school where only yes, two or three um, people who are yes, uh, from Bebra since generations. The others are all um, with the immigration background. We have the Syrian Arabic Republic, 382, and Turkey, Poland, Romania, Ukraine, and North Macedonia. The persons of non German nationality, uh, most of the immigrants live in the city center. See, it's 22%. Um, 450 migrants live in the districts, it's uh, 8%. And the uh, under 16 years old, 30% in the city center, and 60% in the districts. This is a nice picture from the uh, youth center. They went to the Breakdance World Championship. 
we had a close look to the barriers for the immigrants on the way to the political participation. In order to understand why immigrants are strongly underrepresented in the first parliament, it's, it's, it is worth taking a look at the political structures of uh, municipality. Our focus is on the city councillors, and here you can see the city hall with the city councillors as the most important decision makers in a municipality in Hesse. Uh, this photo was taken before COVID. <laughs> And um, here you can see the barriers for migrants without this German passport in the EU foreigners. Um, the greatest barrier for migrants is certainly the electoral law of the federal state of Hesse itself. It's generally excluded non-EU foreigners from voting and being elected. Special bodies such as the Foreigners Advising, Advisory Council or the Integration Commission are supposed to solve this problem, at least partially. The Integration Commission in BEPA consists of 17 members, 17 members and represents 10 different nationalities. It is the only body in which migrants have a seat and a vote according to their share in the population. The Integration Commission has only ad advisory and proposing function. Line. The selection procedure of the parties is another barrier. Another barrier is the structure of the established parties in the city parliament, or better put, the procedure that leads to the drawing up of a party list in the local election. The small local association in the city districts proposed one or two delegates for the party list and expect to be represented by at least one delegate on a promising list position. As a result, this, the districts with the population share of about um, one slash three of the total city usually provide more than half or even two slash three of the delegates to a party list. The selection produce of the procedure of the parties. In addition, the majority of the migrants population live in the core city and not in the districts. And thus the probability that uh, a delegate from the local association of the parties has a migrant background is extremely low. The imbalance cannot be compensated for by delegates from the core city. You can see the distribution of papers inhabitants by district 55 four city, 42 districts, and the uh, distribution of the city councillors according to the districts are 32 four city and 68 districts. So there's a lot of more from <coughs> the districts. And this is listed according to the parties, and you see only. Um, Two little parties have more from the four city, the others only more from the districts. Uh, third hurdle for migrants is the electoral procedure. In order to give citizens more open options in the election, cumulation and variegation was introduced in Hesse. It was a big thing when they introduced it because uh, nearly nobody understood what they had to do. Voters have the possibility to compose their own parliament by giving up to three votes to individual delegates of different parties, but they can also cross out delegates on the ballot paper. This individual voting also puts migrants at a disadvantage because they are underrepresented as an electorate and thus have less chance to give more weight to their own people through their vote. And looks a little bit confused, and it is. Um, you know, this is a, a ballot list, and then you can decide okay, I like him, he's a good neighbor, I hate him, he, is, you know, he has black hair or something else. So you can strike out, and you can also give yeah, one party three cross, and there. You, you, the only thing is that you don't have to put 50 crosses there, only 
uh, so how many um, how many people are in the city council? Such process you can put. And then they uh, after the election, um, there's a big thing, and the town hall to put everything in the computer, and then uh, magic happens over, <laughs> and <laughs> we have the final list. Um, <clears throat> the distribution of migrants and vapor are 25%, I told you, and the distribution of migrants and vapor parliament is 3%. And this 3% have a name, it's Johannes Barman, he's the only one. The conclusion is yes, the imbalance between the proportion of migrants and the population and the representation in the city parliament is very clear. If one wants to solve this problem, many different steps with, with different res responsibilities are necessary. We figured out some steps, maybe there are more, maybe some of them are not the right things. The first was change the municipality electoral law. The right to vote is linked to the duration of resistance in a municipality or in Germany, not to nationality. But this is a thing I think uh, never have happened. Parties established a quote for migrants when following up their electoral list, analog to the quote for women. Maybe, maybe not. The administration and parliament aggressively promote participation in the parties and voters association with a focus of, on disadvantaged groups. I think this is a chance. Political education becomes a compulsory subject in, at schools, in schools. Um, I think this is really, really necessary to do to, in small municipalities that uh, there is a, um, uh, that they can go to the consulars and the consulars go to school like this. And uh, last, citizen participation is consulated and always includes minorities. And there we have a future workshop with the framework of PISTA, and we are looking forward to this. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. In any case, now the next speaker is Martina Todisco from the Second Tree Organization of Greece. I don't know who it is. Not Martina, but it's not Martina. Not Martina. Martina. <laughs> Martina, you so much. <laughs> Martina is there, but I'm the official clown of the organization. Oh, okay. ah. So, uh, the representative of uh, the organization will talk about community engagement for refugees' political participation in Ioanna City. Ioanna City is in, uh, on the western part of, of Greece, near the border of uh, with Albania. And, uh, Three letters of hostage the refugees that have been there for five years, one of them being uh, really outside the city center with a big arena that hosted close to at some point 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. So 
No, 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 funziona, è che non so perché ho saltato, c'è cioè il file sbagliato, no? Beh, se no improvviso, mi sono perso. Dove sono andato a finire la slide? Allora, possiamo, possiamo fare il prossimo persona, io intanto giusto. Volendo fare il sistema? No, ok, no. Ok, vado, vado. Non so perché le, le, le slide di mezzo sono saltate. Ora devo, probabilmente ho so, copiato il file sbagliato, però vabbè. So I don't know where my slide went. So some you will see, some you will not see, and I will be very creative in explaining. Okay. So when I, uh, in 2018, in a community center like this, a guy came to me very, very, very angry. And uh, he said, the teacher treat me badly. I speak a little bit of Arabic, he knew I was kind of a manager and I had no idea what had happened. And what had happened was that our teacher had told him, you have to be in class on time. You're very strict with rules. The class starts at four. If you come in at 4.06, the door is closed. You cannot enter. The class space is a shrine, is a place only for learning. I had no idea what had happened. So I went to, to him and I said, well, why don't we go and talk to the teacher? And so we started going up to the stairs and I realized that the door was closed and I said, Abdallah, like we have to wait 20 minutes and then we go and talk to the teacher. And he said, oh, the rule applies to you as well. Then no problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, you all like this story because I'm applying the same rules to me and to the rest of you know, here this other story. Two years earlier, I was managing the distribution of clothes in Camp Katsikas. At a very specific moment was the worst camp in Greece. You know, many had just closed, there was nothing. You will see it. This is the first picture I took in that camp. And People had just come from Syria and they were coming and asking for clothes and there were not many clothes. So we had to give the little that we could. And one of my strongest tools with people was telling them when they were asking, I want more trousers or more, more t-shirts and we didn't have them, was telling them, look at my trousers. Look, I have holes here. But like, I'm like you. Like we cannot have everything. Now, this kind of story in which I supposedly rich, supposedly white, well, not supposedly white, but a <laughs> uh, person say, oh, I'm like you to so the refugee sounds a little more strident, right? Like, how can I do this? Now, In these seven years in working in refugee camps, what we have learned is that the only way to do participation is to tell people we are one community. Often people like us, for sure people like me, have the tendency of saying we have to focus on power imbalances. We have to acknowledge how different we are. And by doing that, we encourage a form of separation, a form of othering. 
and 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 it's interesting and it's important to say that this happens in good faith because we see people as vulnerable or we see them as beneficiaries of services but the way to empower people or to encourage people to be part of the same group is exactly to be to include them in the same idea in the same uh, practice. You're not special, you're not different, you're not a hero, you're not a victim, you're not the victim of your cultural milieu. You're an individual and you're part of the same group as us. Or we're trying to do that. This is the ethos of our organization, but it's clearly something we had no idea about in 2016 when we started. So this is the first picture of the camp. There were 1,300 people living in tents. They had nothing. They had actually, they were sleeping on stones. This is the first thing I did in the camp here at the public houses. Um, I went around the different factories uh, of the area to ask if they had leftover foam for people to sleep in, to live on because they, didn't, they were sleeping on the stone. They were given by the army, two blankets, and a place in a tent with seven other people. And we, random volunteers would show up to, to help for two weeks, had no clue, didn't know what to do. So we went to these people and we said, guys, we have no idea how to do this. If you want to help us, if you want us to help you, you have to help us help you. And what we were doing there was building a community. <coughs> and we didn't know that that's what we were doing, but especially when I say we, I mean all of the people that were, that were stakeholders, we would say now, at the time we didn't know of the camp, the people that were living the camp, the people that were experiencing the camp. So, This was the, the beginning of understanding things through the lens of one community. It, it's kind of strange to say, but it's the opposite of the humanitarian sector mantra, friendly not friends. We're very strict with rules. I, I, I want to be able to go to Mohammed's tent and not be accused, understandably, that I'm favoring him over the next door family, next door and extend family, uh, because I go to have dinner with them. So I have to be very strict with rules. I need to have a reputation that is very strict, but at the same time, being very close to people, explaining everything we do, spending time, sometimes having discussion, not avoiding conflict, uh, talking about religion, about mm, politics, about anything. What is this? A school. How do you know it's a school? Okay, smart. However, <laughs> it's here that was written helicopter. Would you say this is an helicopter? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. So what 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 what, that, what what makes that a school is clearly that it's written school, but it's also what that community projects in that school. It's clearly not the kind of school we all went to, but it's a school because it was the only tent in the camp in 2016 that had a wooden floor. However, every morning we would be in a very shitty situation. And I mean this literally, in the sense that we would wake up and there would be human excrements all over that flooring. Why? Because it was the only wooden floor in the whole camp. There were 13 chemical toilets for 1,300 people. And so that was the most logical things, thing to do for people that didn't have another option and didn't feel ownership of the place. And so for a few weeks, we, that's what we did. We would wake up, clean the shit, and start the school. 
And then one day we <clears throat> said, I don't think we want to do this anymore. We, we didn't have really a theoretical background material, but, but, but it was kind of like, why, why, why is this us and them and we are doing, like we are, we are projecting this idea of, okay, they're victims, so we need to clean the shit. So we decided, okay, if you don't want to do this, if you don't want to have uh, a school for your children, we will stop. And that's the moment in which I met Firas. I hadn't seen Firas for two and a half months. He hadn't got out of his tent. I have kind of a, an Excel mind. I knew all the names and the tent numbers of the people. Actually, this sounds like a joke, but I became the coordinator of those volunteers because I knew how to use Excel, the skill that was needed to. <laughs> and Firas came to me and said, okay, let's do this together. I will go tent by tent to all the people and say, okay, now we do this thing together. You give us wood, you will give us teachers for the language classes, uh, but we will build the school together. And this is him with Bassam, Katri, and Noor building it. It's still not the kind of school that we've gone to. It's a wooden school. And also sometimes turns into a, oh, I, I had a, a picture that is not here, into a gym. This actually is not supposed to show this, but this is a bell. And it was the bell that Firas in the morning would bring all around the camp, getting the curses of all the parents that wanted to sleep and alerting the kids that it was time to go to school, like in a normal community, like in a place where we've grown up and where we wanted to uh, invest in the education of our children. And when the camp closed in 27th of December, 2016, this bell ended on, under a pile of clothes. And, uh, and, 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 and I had the, the I, I saved it. And uh, when Firas left to Sweden, he was uh, an electric, electrical engineer. Like now what he does in Sweden is, he's part of the special team who, uh, restores electricity when a tree falls on an electric, electric grid, which apparently is very important in Sweden. And, but at the time he was the headmaster of the school. And that was the most important thing like for him from being a victim, from being the, um, the, the outcome of that refugee camp, he, he had a meaning. And in that, and with that bell, I brought it to him before leaving and he started crying. Like I had never seen Siraz cry. Like never in my, like he, his daughter was born in the camp, Mary. Like he had seen like the stone throwing between his cousin and his friends, Palestinians and Kurds. But when I brought him this, this bell, he started crying because that was what, had been important. And he told me, oh, well, well, I'll put it on my fireplace in Sweden and you come to see me. And I thought, oh, that's not all the houses in Sweden have a fireplace. And then he sent me a picture of a house with <laughs> a fireplace and the bell. Um, okay, there are many things that I would want to say, but. Okay. Okay, I'll say, uh, I'll say this. And then I have 30 seconds for the Embrace project, which is actually what I should suppose to tell you. But... <laughs> okay, this is Christine. We have done a project, a, a twinning project, an integration project in which we pair refugee families and local families. And for this project, she found a job in Vitos, which is the deepest gorge in Europe. Montenegrins say that they have the longest, but the, the deepest gorge in Europe, the deepest canyon is in Greece. And she went to work there as a cleaning lady. Wanted to cook in the evenings a uh, Cameroonian dinner. Couldn't do it yet, but you know she 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 was you know up her upping her life somehow after living in a camp. We went to see her, and she lived in this nice bed and breakfast, three kilometers away from the deepest gorge in Europe. 
where people from all over the world go to see her. And she had never seen it. She had never gone there. And so we said, okay, like all of your customers go there, let's go. And here you see like the gorge here, there is like a deep, deep, deep canyon, just like scared. And we took her there. And in that moment, I realized that this was the first moment in probably five or 10 years that Christine had done something for herself. She was not going to that place because she was fleeing for something. She was looking for something. She had an appointment. She needed help. No, no, she was here because she wanted to be there. And let, think about how each one of us, like have, even the most busy of us, have like the 15 minutes in which you have a walk and you enjoy uh, how you do in your life. And, and that moment where she said, okay, I'm actually going to a place because they want to go to that place was the first time that she had done that. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, flash forward many slides. We, we, off of this community engagement model that we built, we created first a training for our staff then some small organizations here and there asked us for the same training. And then many years later, we created another project, an Amish project like this, in which we do training on municipalities on how to engage with migrants and refugees, and especially on how to transfer trust. Right? People trust us, not because we're nice, but because we're truthful. Like how, how can I transfer this to municipalities. We work now with 11 municipalities. We work with six NGOs that complement our model. And what we're trying to do is create a sort of network of virtuous or passionate local authorities that want to um, think of integration as something in which there is one community rather than different groups of people that represent their religious, identitarian, or ethnic group. Thank you. Well, the next presenter is Irakilis Dimitriadis and uh, Paola Bonizoni. from the University of Milan. And the title of the uh, presentation is Civil Society and Migration in Italian Small Towns, Analyzing Bottom-Up Practices of Inclusion. Okay, so I will start maybe to save time. So in our presentation, we try to shed light on the role that civil society actors can play in supporting migrants and refugees in medium and small sized town, focusing especially on two medium sized towns in Italy that are Como and Bustor City. Recently, more and more studies have tried to address. Uh, okay, yes. So recently, more and more studies have, have tried to grasp which specificities, if any, can be observed both in the characteristics and in the ways of operating of civil society in small contexts. It has been observed that, contrarily to what happens in big city, the field of civil society is usually less complex and less heterogeneous in terms of identities, degrees of professionalization, and so on. 
And this has several implications. Networks in small contexts are usually shorter. They are thicker. Roles often overlap. Access to local governmental actors is potentially easier. And social control is also greater. The fact that civil society actors in small contexts can be less resourceful in terms of fund, number of volunteers, but also cultural capitals and skill has also been discussed. While it is a bit controversial in our view, it might be true in some cases, while in others not. What civil society actually does to support migrants and refugees also depends on the relationship that these actors establish with local governmental actors, especially with local municipal actors. In this respect, the latter might be more or less proactive, so to say, more or less friendly, more or less uh, hostile, even in some contexts. And depending on the case, a civil society can make up for the lack of specific public services. They can be externalized, the provision of specific services, or they can exercise sometimes even advocacy, sometimes even conflict, defending the rights of migrants and refugees. So more specifically, support to non-entitled migrants. I think about undocumented migrants, out of reception asylum seekers, Unaccompanied minors, 2019, is especially critical as it provides a potentially important bridging function, lessening the impact of uh, potential niches of social exclusion at the local level. <laughs> so medium and small, uh, small sized town in Italy can mean many, many different things. Uh, it is a very heterogeneous landscape, including rural, mountainous, and more or less peripheral suburban context. While the share of migrants living outside big cities in Italy has been constantly growing over the last two decades, the refugee crisis of 2015 has represented a turning point. Uh, the growing number of transit migrants in border cities like uh, Ventimiglia or like Como, for instance, the spread of refugees reception facilities all over the territory have impacted in new ways um, context that did not necessarily have a previous experience of migration, and it has also triggered citizens' mobilization both in favor and against the arrival of these new migrants. So in this presentation, we focus on two paradigmatic local contexts, Como, a border town, and Busto Sizio, let's say a problematic city of refugee dispersion. You might not be familiar with Como. This is a town located at the northern Italian border with Switzerland. It has a long established history of migration, but especially after the implementation of stricter border control from the Swiss authorities in the summer of 2016, it became a place where an increasing number interest of migrants interested in moving north towards uh, Switzerland and uh, other countries in Northern Europe found themselves stuck basically. So the refugee crisis turned into a homelessness crisis in Como, and the role of civil society has been relevant in providing resources to a population that took time, so to say, to be recategorized as asylum seekers and being inserted consequently in the governmental reception system. All this happened in a context of the lack of cooperation, I would say sometimes even open hostility by local municipal actors. Okay, so Bustar City is a small town in uh, northern Italy. Uh, it has been selected as a locality of, uh, that experienced some of the failures of uh, the Italian refugee dispersal policies. One of these negative aspects uh, was the creation of reception facilities that hosted a big number of uh, people, of asylum seekers, and have been managed by private actors such as NGOs, uh, hotel owners, or other conventional employers. Who aim to, at making profit of the uh, situation without being interested in people's uh, dignity in terms of living conditions and also integration. So the establishment of such a reception center in uh, Bustar City triggered the creation of an anti-refugee movement on the one hand and led pro-migrant uh, supporters, uh, third sector actors and lay people to engage in everyday action uh, actions destined to help refugees and asylum seekers. Another two points. First, these civil society actors had limited experience uh, 
in relation in dealing with migrant population in general. And second, this location has been traditionally governed by xenophobic uh, center right wing anti immigrant coalitions. Uh, this, uh, this paper uh, draws on uh, two uh, the research projects one um, uh, conducted from 2018 to 2020 focusing on the uh, actions of uh, third sector uh, organizations and volunteers in dealing with uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And the second one uh, uh, is a Horizon Project, MAGIC, its acronym, focusing on, uh, let's say, uh, among others, the integration of asylum and uh, refugee seekers in, uh, in small and medium cities, but also in Milan. So uh, we conducted, uh, let's say, this, uh, this interviews with uh, various actors. So as you can see, uh, we, uh, we try to, uh, let's say, uh, interview different people with different roles and uh, different expertise from, uh, from case workers, from, uh, from managers to NGO volunteers, uh, religious actors involved in the, uh, let's say, in, uh, in dealing with people, also lawyers and so on. Um, okay. A concrete example of the potentially virtuous effect of those thick and short nets typical of uh, small and medium-sized contexts is provided by these two interviews that were carried out in Como with two volunteering guardians uh, of unaccompanied minors. These two guardians are well known in the local community. One is a municipal social worker. The other one is also a founding member of the local branch of a well-known organization, Refugees Welcome, that you might know. She is also has a very long established experience in the field of international cooperation. And thanks to her local rep uh, reputation, basically, and to her connection, she was able to find employment to several unaccompanied minors she has been taking care of. Moreover, both of them stress that their connection can somehow lessen the impact of the transition that unaccompanied minors experience when turning 18, they lose their right to local reception measure as they would be able to support them in finding temporary accommodation through the different association and the welcoming families they know personally very, very well. So other than providing services, short net and multiple roles can also favor potentially the exercise of advocacy. For instance, this is an interview carried out with an association in Bustor Sitio that shows how the close connections established between professionalized actors on the one hand, volunteers of independent organization on the second hand, and local political actors, especially municipal actors, while on the one hand, sometimes blur the boundaries between civil society, governmental, and market actors. And on the one hand, it can also favor the construction of a potentially critical local arena, where uh, not only good practices are exchanged, but also potentially problematic issues, like in this case, the very bad functioning of a local government reception system can be collectively discussed, problematized, and brought to attention of local power holders, in this case, the prefecture. Another interesting point concerning the case of Como is the creation of close and direct relationships between third sector organizations and social actors implementing uh, control, such as the police. So uh, as these quotations show, we observe that uh, two third sector organizations and uh, police headquarters in Como closely collaborate in dealing with homeless migrants. Uh, this is one example, for instance. Uh, so there is a close collaboration uh, because the association provides a fake uh, home address to homeless people so the latter can be registered as residents of the municipality of common, therefore can access welfare uh, services. Another association providing, provides legal services to migrants um, and uh, many of whom lack legal status and the police headquarters that tolerate this uh, situation and collaborates with this organization to find a solution. Although these relationships between uh, this actor is the result of compromises, uh, it seems that this can be a win-win situation for all of them. Third sector organizations provide help to migrants and the police do not have to deal with homelessness, uh, for instance, or possible uh, dysfunctionalities in the, in the public order. What characterizes the practices of uh, these uh, third sector organizations in this small town 
is on the one hand the dense networks between uh, social actors uh, which enable the construction uh, yeah uh, the, the close uh, sorry the close relation between these actors that uh, this element enables the construction of relations of trust uh, over time and on the other hand we can say uh, that uh, this is possible uh, because there is not an, an ideological polarization so the ideolo ideological polarization is limited is weak uh, among third uh, sector actors and uh, pro migrant actors are less radical uh, people know each other and it's not likely the formation of radical pro migrant groups as one would expect uh, in a city like milan or athens or thessaloniki for instance and uh, the a last point in our presentation refers to the to the element of uh, low visibility or invisibility characterizing uh, third sector organization actions all these quotations uh, suggest that migrant supports avoid participating in protests or events or events that involve their being visible in the city and this uh, mainly concerns Bustar but only uh, but also uh, como to, to a certain extent so regardless of the ideological and the political positioning of volunteers on third or people participating on working for third sector organizations volunteers and social workers uh, find it counterproductive to create polemics and in a small city ruled by xenophobic governments uh, so for instance when our research participants talk about protesting they mainly refer to the eventuality of joining uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers who protested against uh, poor conditions in that problematic uh, facility in Bustar Sitio. And also, they had also protested the refugees and asylum, asylum seekers because the uh, municipality obstructed the issuing of uh, some documents. So, uh, social actors, volunteers do not participate. They try to make a kind to promote a kind of advocacy, but they don't participate actively because they don't want to be visible. And also another quotation here shows that, uh, for instance, um, the, a volunteer of an association created the flag for the association, but he doesn't want to hang the flag uh, outside the building of this uh, of the house uh, when people live, uh, where people live, because they don't they doesn't want to create some kind of conflict with neighborhood uh, with neighbors. So uh, and. We, uh, we, it's not likely that this could happen in Milan, for instance, because such a kind of flag would be invisible to neighbor to the neighborhood and to neighbor in a big city like, uh, like Milan. And we close with this. Uh, do we have uh, one minute or we are done? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, conclude shortly. Yeah, one minute. One minute. We can do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, <laughs> very briefly, uh, some uh, some points we we focused on and uh, we highlighted in this paper. So there is an uh, easiness in uh, networking building, uh, and also the multiple and overlapping uh, roles. Uh, let's say enable third sector organizations to provide uh, crucial, uh, crucial resources to refugees. And also uh, we uh, highlighted the point, the point of the limited heterogeneity and weak ideological distinction among civil society actors. Uh, and this has some implications and uh, shapes, let's say the relations between uh, actors, uh, different actors, for instance, civil, civil society actor and police or civil society actors and uh, municipalities and so on. And uh, another uh, important element is the local uh, hostile attitudes that shapes and uh, influence, uh, let's say, the practices of, uh, of third sector uh, organizations. And uh, also uh, one, uh, one, uh, one interesting um, difference uh, we identified between Com and Usa Sizio has to do with the long-standing uh, long experience of uh, uh, third sector organization Como in dealing with migrants in border uh, towns. And uh, this enables them to, um, to uh, promote a great range of, uh, let's say, services. And uh, they acquire expertise over time that uh, really uh, makes the difference uh, when one deals with uh, migrants. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Well, but sometimes, um, Gina Espinera from the University of A Coruña, you know, La Coruña or A Coruña? A Coruña. Thank you. And Sara Miguel from Utrecht uh, University. Is she here? No, she's not here. No, no. You know, we go ahead talking about the role of citizen migrants' engagement in realizing welcoming spaces, a comparative analysis in various European shrinking localities. That's interesting. It is it, it, this like yesterday. Oh, okay. I have a PDF that well, um, it's it's fine because we are running in time. So, well, good, good morning. I'm associate researcher within the uh, project uh, Welcoming Spaces in Europe. Revitalizing shrinking areas by hosting non EU migrants. This is another Horizon 2020 project. It is coordinated by Professor Annelies Summers at the University of Utrecht. Uh, five European countries are taking part, namely Spain, Italy, Poland, Germany, and the Netherlands. It is made up of universities and social entities in the different countries. The project is started in, 20, in March 2020. So we are now in the last year of work before in the analytical phase by developing the results. Uh, the starting point in our work is to rethink the relationship between migration and development. And we want to do so from the reality of local context in shrinking regions where people and municipalities are making efforts to revitalize the territory. To this end, one of the primary questions for the project is how to achieve development that is sustainable environmentally, socially, economically, while being inclusive and open to the arrival of new inhabitants. We have studied 50 shrinkage localities in these five countries with a predominance of rural and semi-rural localities. Also, we have also explored some cases in urban contexts. Mm. We adopt a multiple case study perspective rather than a comparative approach. I'm not going to do all on the methodological issues, only to say that the data has been collected by engaging with intensive fieldwork based on participatory observations, in-depth semi-structured interviews, focus groups, and moreover, in a selection of localities, we carried out a participatory methodology based on photo waste. The pictures in the first uh, here in, in this slide were uh, the result of the photo voice. So it, uh, the definition of a, shrink a shrinkage depends on national, regional, and local context, but it denotes in general terms depopulation and economic decline. And it is characterized by below average income rates where job creation, maintenance of certain services or generational replacement pose significant challenges. It, is, it seems relevant for us to highlight the economic dimension of a shrinkage since part of the literature, especially that dealing with migration, focuses the debate on population slash repopulation uh, processes. And this also deserves a critical perspective. Now, one of the main issues raised in our research is that welcoming spaces need not only the support of the society, but also its engagement. Throughout our analysis, we found that the most successful cases in terms of having managed to activate initiatives that make the territory more dynamic propose new ways of understanding the participation and engagement of the community. And I will show you later two, two examples. So rather than looking at the question of who promotes participation, we find relevant to examine the instances in which residents build welcoming spaces and where newcomers and long-term residents interact and articulate initiatives. 
We are therefore interested in paying attention to the condition in which these engagements are produced, how they work, how they are organized, what strategies are developed, formal and informal interactions, external relations and networks. We use the term engagement to signal that we are not exclusively focusing on migrants' political participation in institutional settings, but examining a broad spectrum of activities and emerging sociabilities that can form the basis for new kinds of political action. Moreover, we have opted the concept of emplacement as the backbone of our analysis as Lick Schiller and, and uh, Sagler note, emplacement is not just another word for integration. Emplacement refers to the relationship between the restructuring of a place within networks of power and the person's effort within the barriers and opportunities to build a life within the networks of local, national, supranational, and global interaction. So for the authors, it is crucial to understand the full range of local sociabilities, to understand how, where, why, and within what structural contingencies some residents build social relations, common domains of affect, mutual respect, and shared aspirations. It is also interesting to think that if we broaden the focus of engagement to these dimensions, to some extent, we upload the, board, the burden of the act of engagement itself, for, for instance, civic engagement and the effort it can take for people to engage. So uh, I would now like to share some of the issues that have attracted our attention and which may be of interest since uh, they have not yet uh, come up in the debate. That is the advantage of speaking on, on the second day. Broadly speaking, many of our observations coincide with findings that have already been discussed here. The issue of how to upscale the best practices identified is also related to what Andrea commented yesterday on knowledge transfer and the lack of exchanges of this diffusion. Also the idea that welcoming initiatives in small towns tend to be fragile, fractured, and uncoordinated. The role of individual actors, especially uh, people of migrant background, acting as mediators and uh, as bridges. Also, how important is the role of civil society, enti entities, trade unions, and the extent to which municipalities support them. We also observe that while participatory processes work at the micro level, when we move up to other administrative levels, it is diluted. Here we find a strong criticism and political disaffection due to the lack of channels for participation in decision making, as well as, as, well as the perception that decisions are taken by people who are unfamiliar with the localities, are taken far away from the places. Also the question of belonging raised by, by Ruth yesterday and how welcoming spaces bring the locality new scenarios of belonging, bonding, compromise that need to be valorized from a policy making perspective. Undoubtedly, the conditioning factors exerted by the regulatory framework on the integration and participation of migrants. If we want to talk about participation, we need to comprehend how migrants can navigate differential access to rights. How do agency and rights interact? For instance, in the case of undocumented migrants. I would like now to present very briefly two cases that raise other issues uh, to contribute to the debate. Both cases are in Spain. Can I move this? Oh, okay. Sorry, because many messages appear on the screen due <laughs> to Teams. <laughs> okay, so um, the first, both places are, are located in, in Spain. The first is Burela. It is a semi-rural town um, located on the north coast of Spain in the region of Galicia. It has 9,000 inhabitants. The foreign population represents more than 20%. The largest proportion of people of migrant background are 
of Cape Verdean nationality settled for more than four decades in the locality. Also, the territory is home to residents from Peru, Senegal, Morocco, Colombia, Indonesia, Brazil. 40 nationalities in total are registered in, in the town. Burela is a relevant case to reflect on what the role is of migrant-led initiatives in creating welcoming spaces and to bring into focus the transnational dimension and how this engagement is gendered. The first migrant-led associations started in the early 2000s. They started from informal meetings and progressively became more structured. The work uh, carried out together with the third sector to highlight the needs of inhabitants of migrant background led to the first integration plan adopted by the municipality and was the first in the whole region of Galicia. This institutional context also has powered the emergence of, of a welcoming place here. The specific case of Cape Verdeans organizations is of particular interest as it has a strong translocal component. These associations are part of the diaspora and as such are also formed as bridges with other localities in the country of origin, conforming therefore uh, what has been called development corridors. Development corridors that reflect the idea that local development opportunities are much determined by what is happening in other places. The recomposition of networks becomes a fundamental aspect of engagement with the place of Burela, as they generate intergenerational knowledge transfer, material and immaterial remittances with the resulting emotional and effect, uh, effective uh, displacements. In Burela, we observe that this engagement is also gendered, that as the transnational network has been maintained mainly by women. Women through third chains between different localities where the Cape Verdean diaspora is located. We find multi-site transnational families with members in France, in Spain, in Portugal, and Cape Verde, whose ties are maintained by women. And this, in the case of Urela, has facilitated the emergence of self-organized associations led by women. So what is insightful from here is that the role that women play in the diaspora as transmitters of links, her translates in the case of Burela into greater participation and greater presence in, in social and public spaces in the town. Here in the first pic, you can see, well, uh, uh, down um, on, on the bottom, sorry, you can see uh, the Batuco Tabanca Women's Dance Group who claim that preserving and dis disseminating folklore has become a way of highlighting the condition of migrant women. And the second pick uh, is an assembly of the Tabanka Association aimed at providing a support network to newcomers. So um, let me move now to the second. Okay, now I cannot change my slide. Oh. Okay, perfect, thank you. The second case, is Quintana Redonda is a rural municipality in the region of Castilla y Leon. It's part of what has been called España Vaciada, empty Spain. The population which has been increasing in recent years stood at uh, 496 inhabitants. The people who come to settle in the town are of foreign origin, mainly from outside the EU, Peru, Cameroon, Senegal, Ecuador, as in the case of Burela, we are faced here with a series of initiatives activated by the public administration and social entities, which have generated a uh, facilitating context of, for the arrival of new inhabitants. On the one hand, at the municipal level, the city council has a, an attracting newcomers plan to help newcomers find accommodation uh, and giving temporary jobs on arrival mediation with neighbors, NGOs, and enterprises. In this locality, we also find Nuevos Senderos program led by a social entity, SEPAIN, 
with a statewide implementation. The program aims at supporting newcomers to settle in rural areas, mediating with public administrations, enterprises, providing training and support. But the initiative that has caught uh, our attention, attention has to do with self-employment in the resin production sector. Every year, the local council calls for tenders for the exploitation of municipal owned pine forests and for the extraction of the resin. And this practice um, um, that has been revived in recent years for the economic and ecologically sustainable revitalization of the town, here we find that more and more people of migrant origin are taking part in this activity. They take part in municipal tenders and register uh, as self-employed to work in the extraction of resin. Two aspects are emphasized in the interviews. First, a process of social mobility. Most of them previously worked in the agricultural sector in large farms where working conditions were precarious and, and are precarious and, and exhausting. And second, the possibility of becoming uh, self-employed means, in these cases, greater autonomy, higher income, and above all, more time. Yesterday, uh, we, we talk about time temporalities and engagement. So here we, we have a case in which people claim for time. Having time uh, allows for greater engagement and attachment to the place where they work. So I think I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm done because I have no time, right? <laughs> okay, so thank you. Sorry. For some reason. So for me, it's been interesting. What I keep basically, I don't know, is uh. On, on the first presentation, uh, the common uh, elements in terms of uh, uh, the barriers that people have to political and civil participation and the recommendations that they made, which I think uh, they can pretty much apply to all European contexts in all countries. Uh, from the other participation, it's very interesting to note uh, uh, the non-authoritative approach as a means of uh, promoting engagement of people and inclusion. Uh, in them on an equal basis and bearing uh, the authoritative uh, approach that many uh, people dealing with refugees and migrants are uh, utilizing uh, their daily work. Iraklis uh, and Paola Bonizoni uh, shed light on uh, how to, what I kept uh, and found extremely interesting is the examples of uh, actual engagement without polarization between uh, frontline workers and the authorities. And sometimes uh, it seems according to the example that uh, you can overcome uh, uh, very barriers by, how can I say, align with the devil or for the example, the police, uh, and it can produce more. And uh, also the, uh, we should all keep in mind that you can get more results instead of going to Milan stadiums with an in the, uh, said, I mean, try to make peace in another way and not be so confrontational because it can be counterproductive. So we're going to be having a, a really uh, short break. We have a lot of water, <laughs> a few cookies, many napkins, so be my guest. And uh, really short, guys, in like five minutes, seven minutes, nine minutes or whatever, uh, we'll have to start the other session. I'm <laughs> 
That's a bit of a challenge. Apostolos Papadopoulos. Another sociologist, we're, we're heavy on sociology here uh, on this roundtable. But he had holds a PhD in geography, and I think that's what happens to urban sociologists. At some point, they turn into geographers. Uh, he's also the president of the Hellenic Sociologists Association in Greece uh, and specialized in both rural transition and migration studies, labor markets, social spatial justice, etc. Uh, and is on the board of a number of journals that also reflect both of these topics. And finally, um, <coughs> Anita Sorosieva. She is from Belgium uh, and represents the municipality of Nino West. Um, and she's there responsible for the policy of transversal domain of equal opportunity, which includes the integration of persons of foreign origin persons with disabilities, the LGBTQIA plus community and the global uh, equity policy. So that this is our panel and we will have a first round where I ask the panelists to introduce their work uh, and also explain what is the role of small towns and migration in the work that they do, what are their key lessons? And I give you like three minutes each to explain that. And um, let's start women first. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. And uh, I'm happy to be part of uh, this interesting program. And yesterday we got a lot of information and uh, we have to summarize a bit. So um, uh, I'm representing um, an umbrella organization as mentioned before. We are active in 10 German states um, and we have over 700 migrant organizations um, in our network. And in this network, um, we have projects um, all in these 10 German cities and uh, not just in the state, in small cities, medium sized cities, and in some very, very small cities like Oyezveda with a population of about 30,000 inhabitants. Um, uh, what is very interesting about our organization is that we know that integration starts from where you live, at the, where you live at the local level. So we try to come up with programs, we try to come up with projects that will influence the early participation of migrants at this level. So we have one, one of our members have a very interesting project that is also in Greece here. And this project is Employing Migrant Voices on Integration and Inclusion. It's an AMIT project and it will run up to the end of uh, 2023. And uh, this project takes place in uh, five countries here, Germany, Austria, Greece, uh, Slovenia, and Italy. And in the partner in Greece here is Symbiosis. Is anyone from Symbiosis here? Um, Okay, and the municipality here in Greece is Heraklion. Heraklion. Did I pronounce it well? Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, part of this uh, project is that we need to work with municipalities. Um, why do I say that as a migrant, um, when you come to a new city, you want to be part of that city? And what is missing sometimes is that uh, we always try to categorize they and us. And as mentioned in one of the presentation, we should talk about we as a community. Once we start defining the situation as we, things will get better for everyone. Talking about small, I don't know if I'm over three minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, <coughs> What is important is that you see the different dynamics. In smaller cities, you have um, very, almost no migrant organizations in the cities, but in medium-sized cities, you already have established a um, migrant organization. So we do encourage migrants to come together to build self-organizations, because if you don't build those kind of self-organization, it's difficult to communicate with the local government, it's difficult to communicate with other partners. 
So we do encourage migrants to, to come up with their own organization and try to put their thoughts together and try to put their wishes together and talk to the local government so that they can create a plan for everyone. This plan should not be they and us. It should be a plan work together by everyone. I think that is very important when we want to talk about the differences between smaller and medium cities. Maybe I'll leave it at that level. Yeah. Okay. So the definition of small and medium sized towns is a very relational concept, I realize, because Hoya uh, Svea, that is already big, you know. Uh, Bebra has 13,000 uh, inhabitants, much smaller even. Okay, anyway, um, Irina, what is your take on this? Uh, well, as from my experience um, here, and I myself uh, have been working on uh, migrant integration in uh, medium and small uh, towns for some years now, and right now we are involved in several Horizon 2020 projects uh, for COM. Uh, yesterday, Andrea presented a piece of the of, uh, of uh, that work. Uh, also, welcoming spaces. Uh, Kena has just presented some results from from Spain. And we, we have collaborated also with, with the project Matilda as one of the partners. And Matilda is on um, migrant integration and impact on um, social uh, and economic dynamic in uh, municipalities located in the mountain areas. Um, on the other hand, we are involved in more <laughs> policy oriented projects. Uh, at, at local level, at regional level. Uh, and in this kind of project, generally, we um, support the decision makers. With, I mean, we evaluate and assess uh, um, public measures on the one hand. And on the other hand, we um, offer training to social workers, <coughs> uh, decision makers, uh, generally adopting a Peer to peer approach. Then we try to foster knowledge transfer somehow uh, rather than uh, teaching what we know, because <laughs> probably those actors uh, often they know more than us about, uh, about local dynamics, uh, even uh, because, as you all know, um, for a long time uh, research on uh, uh, local level has been focused on large cities, then uh, it's a rather new trend, this, uh, um, this interest for uh, smaller, uh, smaller, smaller municipalities. Um, yeah, and our aim is on the one hand to improve uh, uh, this kind of knowledge, and on the other hand, to uh, promote uh, a strategic thinking uh, in uh, uh, the smaller localities. Uh, of course, I mean, large cities, uh, uh, as strategic thinking by definition. Uh, while the problem, uh, as far as uh, we, we see, the problem of, of smaller localities uh, is to develop strategic thinking, develop uh, alliances, uh, and not to be overwhelmed by emergencies, uh, uh, practical problems that are crucial. But uh, uh, if, uh, if you don't make a step forward, it's very difficult to improve the general situation uh, of migrants and of the whole population, because of course integration uh, is about changes of whole population and not of, uh, of migrants specifically. Then, yeah, that's more or less what uh, we we are doing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Stein, uh, I know you've been doing research on large cities, because partly we've been doing this together. Uh, and uh, now we're doing research on small towns. Uh, what do you think is the, the, the interesting and the specific moments here? Because small towns are usually sidelined in urban sociology. You know, it's mostly about London, Paris, and New York. Uh, so what's, what's your take on the specifics of small, of small towns? Yeah, I think I think you're right, and I, I very much concur with what Irina has has been saying that there is a shift 
mm -hmm. towards looking more on, on, on small and medium sized cities. It is important because I think universities and knowledge institutions have played quite an important role in, in creating capacity and vision together with big cities. And then just kind of mutually reinforce the relationship between we do research, we show the results, then they get back to us and say maybe we're doing something wrong. So there's a mutually reinforcing relationship on that end, which worked pretty well. Also, because that's also where the universities are located. So I think uh, it's our task now to try to do the same mm -hmm. on the level of small and medium sized uh, uh, cities where we are not, because mostly there is no university presence. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's even more important because I think what we learn is mainly, I think from my point of view, it's really a capacity question. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things are changing and there's a, there is a need to intervene. Not, you cannot leave it like, like it is, you need to intervene. Um, so you need capacity to intervene. And I think what is very specific for these small and medium sized uh, uh, cities is that there is less capacity, both on the level of, of the local government, but also on the level of civil society. Um, we often say uh, small municipalities have to play a sort of coordinating role, but often there isn't that much to coordinate because there are not that many actors on that level. And so I think universities have to kind of uh, put their capacity there as well because that's important to create a kind of reinforcing circle because that will then attract other organizations uh, to, to work in that field. I mean, something that I also understood from you is that, for example, they find it hard to attract social workers to work in their social work because all these social workers that we kind of train, they, 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 they like to work in the big cities because, of course, when they take training with us, we tell them about the big cities. And so I think it's, it's, it's really important to kind of change the dynamic and also you know, be active in these small and medium-sized cities to create capacity. Because from my point of view, it is um, it is unavoidable that these kind of big demographic changes will create polarization, that uh, will create fear and concerns. And I think the only the only way to address that is not by ignoring that, but put capacity there. Because in a way, it is a social investment agenda. If you have this kind of migration, um, it only will uh, for the better. It, only, it will only be for the better of these uh, small and medium sized municipalities if there is actually an investment agenda. So we invest in these people and then something good will come out of that. Um, so it creates capacity. And the second <laughs> important thing is, is the vision. And I, I, I had the sort of same idea as you, Irene, that, that, we, that there needs to be strategic vision uh, to where you want to go because very often it's emergency politics, it's daily crisis management, something happens, they intervene, but there isn't really any strong uh, strategy. However, um, our, our, our recent research on Venmo and, and um, uh, Nino over that, which is presented yesterday, and also ongoing research at the University of Rotterdam, I think about frame ambiguity shows that in a, in a heavily polarized situation, it is, it is not always easy to come out with strategic vision because there's a lot of pressure of the radical rights and it makes it very hard to intervene. So, so sometimes uh, I think there needs to be a vision, but sometimes I can understand why city, why municipalities say we don't want to come out with that vision because then it's just too hard to politically defend that. So in that sense, I'm a bit ambiguous. I think there needs to be a vision, but I also understand that leaving things ambiguous, creating a network, and maybe doing these services at the sort of distance from the government by low, by by non-governmental organizations are saying we have a policy which really is about helping these. Uh, migrants, but we don't portray it as such. We just make it more broader. You know, I understand that in that political situation, that is that is perhaps uh, an easier thing to do. So yes, vision, but perhaps you know, we should be, and in terms of advice, I do understand that some municipalities say, well, let's let's leave it a little bit ambiguous. As long as it happens, that have more important than it's explicitly shown. And then lastly, I think about the uh, small and medium-sized municipalities. I think the size is probably less important than the location. Uh, I think Ninov is in the periphery of Brussels, and that's perhaps more important to what happens in Ninov than the actual size of, of, of Ninov. Uh, I was looking, I was listening about Crete, Crete for example, and these, these small islands. I think there is not the size, it's just that very, very peripheral location, very far removed from any big city, and, and so on, is, 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 is perhaps more important. Um, and that's also something that came out of our discussion before is the case is that in fact, locate, Bibra, for example, is located at the crossroads of railways, which gives a kind of centrality that can be used to, to do something about these, uh, sorry, to do something about these things. And finally, I think something that is perhaps not as well noticed uh, in, the, in the discussion that we had yesterday and today is the, the importance of super local government. 
I think one of the big differences between, at least from my reading of, of what you've been talking about, Southern Europe, like Italy and, and Greece, and, and maybe Spain, is that compared to Western European countries, is that there is an important role for the central government, which guarantees that there is a policy that covers the whole territory. So when the Flemish government say there is going to be an integration policy, there is an integration policy in every municipality. It's guaranteed by the central government. And as I've heard from the Italian and Greek case, that's not necessarily the case. So it's really, really bottom up and it really depends where we are. Sometimes you have a very active local government and then next to it, you have a local government which is not active at all. And then there is hardly anything except maybe some non-profit organizations. And I think that's really important. The role of the central government in guaranteeing that there is a kind of a policy that covers the whole territory. And at least there is a minimum of, of service provision to the extent that in, in some countries maybe that's not present and that creates a kind of difference and maybe more difficult issues. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, I think from the presentation, um, everybody would agree with you on capacities of uh, government and administration. Not sure everybody would agree on your take on the capacities of civil society, because we've also heard about short networks, strong connections. <coughs> Um, okay, but let's let's see. Let's maybe discuss this uh, further in in the in the discussion. Uh, and I'll turn to you now, Ursula. Uh, <laughs> I I really change to pronounce your name. Um, right. So you have this long term experience <coughs> with um, research on rural areas in transition and also with migration, and then. Coming from Greece, probably the situation is really different from like what in Belgium or Germany, what, what we experience, because you have this immediate contact, uh, whereas we have to wait until uh, refugees, for instance, transition through Greece to other countries uh, to, to come to like Germany or, or Belgium. Um, <coughs> You're, you're perfectly fine to say what first what what is the small town. I mean, rural areas is not exactly small towns. No, small towns fall a bit like in between rural studies and uh, urban studies. Um, but what uh, what is your experience with small towns, and uh, what do you think are those specific challenges there? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to say first that I'd like uh, to thank the organizers for the invitation. This is very um, <coughs> I welcome this invitation because uh, on, a, on a project uh, addressing issues of small and medium towns, the, the perspective of rural is, I think, it's informative and uh, enriching the discussion. Because we, normally the discussion is, I think, laid out at the level of urban um, or urbanized uh, processes. And so, uh, having a background in rural sociology and rural geography, um, I have. Um, Mostly, I, I describe myself as a hybrid sociology and, and geography. I believe that one informs the other, so it's just a mixture. Uh, so I, um, I will start from saying a few things about the research we've done in the past to give you a kind of uh, point uh, in the past. Uh, in the, uh, and also say that the, the discussion on, on how migrants and, and re more recently, so to say, refugees are part of rural or not so rural or not urban um, spaces uh, has been uh, is a, a recent issue uh, and this we've done research since the late 90s early 2000 uh, in Greece and comparing Greece uh, southern European countries Greece Spain Italy and uh, this discussion was kind of in its, uh, in its start at that time now uh, there's more light in uh, non so not big cities and uh, less um, uh, sizable cities but uh, we started looking at how migrants in, in entered the agricultural sector and tourism and construction as well and they made difference there since the local population was moving out of those sectors especially in rural areas or less um, uh, less uh, densely populated areas so we've done this work uh, and we continued following the different um, aspects of uh, looking at integration or at looking at how rural transformation plays out 
this kind of new phenomenon. Uh, so we spoke about new immigration countries at the same time, the, the, the role of migrants in rural areas, so both, at both levels. And this discussion has evolved a lot today because a, 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 a large number of people came in and, and, and seeing migration as a kind of diffusion of migration to different aspects of uh, 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 different levels of space. So, uh, and I think, and we've done work at, uh, after mass funding and um, in, um, EU funding and things like that. And, and more recent uh, research we've done uh, is on, uh, in the context of the Horizon project, which has just finished, called Imagine, looking at spatial inequalities and uh, economic inequalities, and at the same time, also the, the role of mobility in, at the regional level. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, if, I, if I was to mention very briefly what we've done is see the rural transformation as a process and at the same time the urbanization process and connect, uh, find a connecting um, string uh, by looking at migrants, not only migrants in the national migration, but also internal migrants, because these, these are people who are also um, are mobile around. We, if we zoom also into international migration, we lose another aspect of mobility that connects urban rural areas, areas in general, and the internal uh, aspect of the internal migration flows. So more recently, we took over this aspect in our discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, having said that, I think uh, to start with about rural areas, I don't think that rural areas is one end of the spectrum and the other end is urban, I would say that there's a kind of um, a lot of space in between. And I would dare say that uh, also small, medium, uh, small and medium sized towns are also can be considered part of the rural to the extent that there are specific socioeconomic and spatial characteristics which resemble more to what is considered the rural as opposed to the urban. So I would see that there is a mixture mm -hmm. of elements of urban and rural in, in towns, but, but not something in between because it's a kind of uh, linear thinking. And I would say that more relational thinking is more, uh, uh, more relevant to our discussion. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the issue of size is very lim is limiting this, the discussion. And it's embedded in the, in the term small, medium-sized towns uh, because it means less population, less densely populated, and a part of housing is there. But also, if we get to the, another aspect of um, of um, settlements, is production, is the production aspect. And we, I think we, uh, we have to look also at the social composition of those areas and their productive capacity. So, and also consider that these areas are in place within regional, semi-peripheral or remote areas. So the context, as has been said, is important to see the, the relevance and the, otherwise the, the notion of small, medium um, sized towns is static <laughs> to be in place within. So in terms of strategic thinking, as you may, uh, it was mentioned already, I think in the case of Greece, it's not that, that the city makes strategic thinking, it's the central authorities make that thing. <clears throat> it's tend to be enough in Saloniki, not in every city. So I, I would say that it's a more like a centralist approach, which is important, and because we don't have this kind of decentralized approach in Greece. It differs a lot across across Europe, of course. But we have to, to think also that strategic thinking as a kind of a more cent uh, centralist aspect in the case, and it varies between countries. So, uh, um, uh, so I think politics matter. And it's, it's, it comes, uh, uh, it emerges from all, most of the discussions of the uh, mm -hmm. presentation. And uh, it's clear that uh, less, I mean, small and medium towns are less powerful are less empowered to do things. And I would like only to drop this uh, by finishing, yeah. not to take more time, but that, that uh, it's a, we identify in our minds small and medium uh, sized towns as places left behind. So I, I wonder whether left behind people and left behind places are identified in the same type of, of space. Uh, of course, I'm not speaking about those towns in, in the Netherlands, because they're not far. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, uh, imagine people who come and, uh, to these areas in order to find security, refugees mostly, or find economic opportunities, 
and they are in place or supposed to be placed in areas which are already left behind. I mean, this is, this I think it's an interesting and very um, challenging um, 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 mixture. Uh, so I, I think the problem is more accentuated in, in such areas, not in all small and medium sized towns, but in those towns which are already left behind and they, they consider the pulling or the inflow of migrants as another um, indication that they are left behind. So this this is this in, in, enlarges the issue of politics and makes populist thinking much more powerful because I think populist thinking is very powerful nowadays and very powerful uh, uh, and instrumentalized rural areas along with migrants. Thank you. Um, this resembles the notion of migrants coming to the inner peripheries of large cities, right? Uh, deprived areas where the same effect occurs. But it's it's uh, it's not my turn to speak. I'd rather hand over uh, to Agnieszka. Um, we've just heard a small towns is not one situation; it's a multitude of situations. Uh, depending on location, depending on relations to, to the centers, uh, depending on the model of governance, etc. Uh, and then um, uh, Apostolo said that uh, small and medium sized towns are less powerful. Looking at Minova, would you agree? So, what, what is your experience in working with uh, migrant communities in a town that is not peripheral, but as Stein said, it's close to Brussels. Um, right. Yeah, it's a difficult question, though, but uh, <laughs> I don't think there is just one answer to it. But I think that, um, yeah, as we know, you have like, as a municipality, you have a connection with the people who live there. So it's, it is quite logical that you uh, get to know the communities, that you have a feeling with the people that live there. But at the same time, uh, you have a feeling that the uh, a federal or um, our government is just um, yeah passing down the responsibilities of uh, the integration policies to you know have a uniform kind of uh, policy. So I think the um, interregional collaborations are also very important because we all have the same problems in our region. Um, and yes, we have a lot of responsibility and we have a lot of choices that we can make. Um, and you can really work um with the context with the local context so for example you know we have um a lot of inter-religious groups that you can work with building communities um we also have this dormant community so people are mostly living still in brussels and just sleep uh in, in Nova. uh so we really try to um yeah get the people uh yeah to feel welcome in Nova. so yeah that's our responsibility Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you didn't really touch the question of power, though. Maybe I get to <laughs> get yeah. to to say a bit more about the your feeling of because you work in the municipality. Do you share this notion of a lack of capacity, <coughs> a lack of resources, or what do you know? Yeah, that's saying? true. We're actually very happy that a university has entered and uh, do this research for us and it is very important to have um yeah somebody on the uh, scientific side because we just you know we try to um get to know our people and work on their demands it's not like a scientific way to uh, do a policy integration policy it's just you get the feeling and touch with people and then you try to you know do something that uh, will work for them it's not like some kind of policy that yeah it's research or something so yeah, it's true. We really need um, the research to come to us. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of challenges already. Actually, I was uh, envisioning that in the next round, uh, we would gather the challenges and maybe the, the needs of small towns uh, to better handle integration, but we've already heard a number of them. And in so many presentations, uh, the notion of the strengths of populist actors uh, popped up yesterday and today, and it has been mentioned now again. 
maybe Elizabeth, uh, uh, because you also said you work in Hoyerswerda, which those who don't know Germany well is situated in Saxony, and Saxony, <coughs> together with Thuringia, the place where we come from, is um, the heart of the authoritarian nationalist um, landscape. So that's where there is uh, the highest support in votes for the AfD and uh, where contestations of migration are really pronounced. Um, and in those places, you try to encourage migrants who may struggle to be there in the first place to form interest groups and represent their own interests. So what, what, what is your uh, experience and what do you think they need uh, to, to be successful and to, to establish a living, a good dignified living in such localities? Um, yeah, like you mentioned, <laughs> those areas are difficult areas to work um, in because it's like uh, um, the welcoming part is not there. You have mm -hmm. a lot of right-wing people in the area. But nevertheless, we still push forward the agenda. People should feel welcome mm. where they go. And that's why it's also very important to talk to the municipalities, which we did. That's also mm. very good. We don't talk just to the migrants, we talk to the municipalities. They have to open up, they have to build trust mm -hmm. with these newcomers. Building trust is very important. And uh, I think it should come from the local government. The local government should be ready to talk to these people. Because if you don't do that, then they don't feel welcome in this area. Nevertheless, it's difficult, like you said, and it's also difficult to create resources or to give resources to these migrants to um, set up these organizations. So we are, in a way, communicating with the local municipalities and uh, we do support the migrants in the fund, in the project that we have. We have to give them funds so they can come together and form their own organization and see how they can push forward their agenda, create a project <coughs> and push forward their agenda, what they want to realize in this area. I mean, some of them are willing to stay in those areas, because I've been to Boesveda, I've been out in, out in to Gusho also, it's a small mm -hmm. city. Um, uh, they are willing to stay, but on the other side of the municipality, um, they need to give them those signs of uh, encouragement, signs of uh, uh, <coughs> welcoming concepts so they can feel good. And it's not just welcoming them, they should also encourage their children to go to school. They should also try to give them job opportunities to talk to them because migrants become with different skills. Like um, someone mentioned yesterday, they, they are skilled workers, they are unskilled mm -hmm. workers, so you have to talk to them to know their needs and to encourage them to be part of a program. Some of them are doctors, so if they are in voice weather, why not talk to them to do the language course and to get integrated into the hospitals, not send them to go and do clinic which is not the case. So you have to talk to the migrants to know their needs because you have different people with different needs, with different interests. And uh, if you don't talk to them, it's difficult. Um, uh, our experience um, as uh, migrants in those areas are not so welcoming. We must say that, and it's also good to say that. So um, uh, people don't think um, when you come to a society or when you come to a small town, you are like received with open hands. I think that aspect has to be addressed. The issue of racism um, should not be thrown under the carpet. <laughs> so people think everything is okay. And I think the municipalities should try to address that and talk about those things openly with the newcomers so they know that um, everything is not um, good as uh, we think. Um, so we do encourage projects. I think projects are always good because it brings people together. And bringing people together, people learn from one, one another, people know the interests of the other people, and I think it's a very good um, concept. Um, one very important thing I would like to um, talk on is the integration and inclusion programs. When creating such programs, I think it should be inclusive. Um, even when it's in a small town, the few migrants that you have there, they should be part of those um, programs. It's not talking about the migrants, you have to talk with them. 
So in creating and designing those integration and inclusion programs, the migrant should be part of it. And uh, I know today we say migrants and in 20 years, we still talk about migrants. We have migrants that have been living in certain areas for over 20, 30 years, and they still don't have the right to vote. So we do encourage the voting rights of migrants at the municipal, at the local level. Um, uh, even in Boyle's Red, I talked to someone who's been living there for over 30 years, and you still don't have the right to vote. And this person has been working and paying taxes, so we do encourage the voting rights of migrants who've been living in certain areas for a very long time. I think they've been part of that area. They should be able to influence um, um, yeah, the decisions at that local level, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, some medium or large cities, they've been coming up with participation law. Um, some cities, they have the right to vote, I think, at the local level, but it's not everywhere. So we do push forward in the agenda of the voting rights. So um, uh, I think maybe it's also good to know that um, uh, um, Maya Angelo once said, we have to do the best we can do. And I think we've been doing our best, like researchers, like uh, migrant organizations like the municipalities, but we have to do better so we create um, a better space for everyone. Yeah. That was this very interesting uh, explanation of the second three organizations this morning. Uh, now the best year to climb the tea was 50 years ago. The second best moment is now. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I think I'll remember that. Um, Irene, um, talking about uh, the strong right-wing um, uh, movements uh, and together with what Elizabeth said on the importance of local government, you live in a country where you now have right-wing government. Um, what is your experience how the, the, the role of the local and maybe even the national government impacts the situation? Because we've also heard about this invisibilization, I think was the term somebody used, and this immediately resembled also our experiences in small towns that you don't too openly advocate for integration work or show what you are doing and you try to always hide this a little bit. Is this something you're experiencing or what's this impact of your right-wing government or so on the situation in small towns? Yeah, it's hard to say what we are going to happen. What well, I would say that generally, when we have right wing government um, protest and uh, public engagement, is higher because mm -hmm. realization is there, then uh, I think that it will happen and it is happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of integration, this government, I mean, seems not to have any concern about the integration. I mean, the mm -hmm. focus is just on arrivals mm -hmm. uh, and on, uh, on borders. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, all those dynamics have no impact on integration because they impact the, the public uh, <laughs> imagination and the public perception. Then, of course, uh, we expect an increase uh, of xenophobic attitudes. Mm -hmm. um, as for, I mean, the local level and small municipalities, uh, I, I do think that, uh, I mean, a, a good way to, to deal with these uh, dynamics uh, that are driven, especially by media, I would say, it is to, I mean, to create um, arenas for um, state and staying and managing conflicts mm -hmm. uh, because uh, conflicts uh, are uh, uh, key components of participation process. In Europe, uh, uh, marginalized groups such as the working class, women, achieved participation through conflict. Then uh, I think that it's important not to stigmatize conflict, but to account for it, to also to value conflict and to manage conflict. And I think that it should be done at local level. And it's a really 
I, I, I think in fact, I, I mean, starting from my experience, of course, it's not a golden rule, rule, but I think that it's a good way to fight this xenophobic uh, uh, trend that is uh, fed by media and right now in Italy uh, by the uh, by the, the national uh, government. And another issue that uh, um, I feel it's very important and much disregarded is uh, language. I mean, also in these two days, uh, we have used old-fashioned language. I mean, and, and I, I, I don't have a, let's say, a pre-tapote solution, an easy solution to, to offer. Uh, I think that we uh, have, all of us have to work hard and long on language to develop a sort of post-migration language, because uh, language uh, shapes uh, cognitive frames and policy frames um, that are the, 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 the stepping stones of policies, of new policies and of a new society. And it, again, uh, it's a work that can and probably has to start at local level. It cannot be a top-down solution where the national government say, okay, now let's start with uh, uh, a new language. And for sure it's not the case in Italy with uh, the, the current government. But I think it's a really good way to, um, yeah, to change things in everyday uh, life and to create different perceptions to be uh, more resilient to these uh, messages uh, conveyed by, 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 by the media. And the last point I want to emphasize is uh, the importance of soft skills. Um, I mean, of course, it's important to create uh, venues and tools for uh, participation of people uh, of migrant origin. But I have to say that I participated in many roundtables and uh, workshops where uh, people of migrant origin uh, were um, used as tokens, as symbols, mm -hmm. uh, to say we are open to diversity. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a migrant here on the table, mm -hmm. but actually they, they could not participate because uh, uh, they, they knew the language, I mean, uh, they, they knew everything, but they didn't know the untold rules of the game mm -hmm. that, that are culturally embedded and sometimes organization specific because some organizations have the wrong rules. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, the way uh, I mean, we we argue our opinion. We speak of gender, and I, 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 I come to an end. Yeah, and we build alliance. It is culturally specific, and in fact, the chances to be heard and to be appreciated and to have an influence. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that the small localities, uh, the, the set of uh, um, let's say. Um, uh, cultural rules defining participation and the modes of participation is smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, on the one hand, it's much more important to, to learn these untold uh, uh, rules. And on the other hand, we have to uh, keep a critical and reflexive uh, look uh, mm -hmm. at those rules and not take them for granted. Yeah. Uh, that is a um, bridges to exactly the question I wanted to address to Stein because um, one myth about small places is um, social cohesion is stronger because everybody knows everybody, which is never true. Uh, the downside of this is social control um, and those very important unspoken rules are part of the mechanisms of social control. Yeah. So being a sociologist, what is your take on this issue of what's the effects of this larger notion of social control that I think we've also heard throughout the presentations with self-censorship, uh, et cetera? So it's a hard question. If I think about the art case in Minova, I, I don't think that it's 
I think the, 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 the immature you know, training of small places or isolated places, which kind of you know, develop on their own, in which they, they have people from generation generation living in the same town. I don't think we have many of these places left in Belgium. I think it's the distances between places in Belgium is so small that in any way, I mean, I think if you're in Europe, people, one of our residents said in Europe, you have actually two two types of migrants here. You have you have the, the migrants which we external migrants coming from other places uh, outside of Europe or outside of, of, of Western Europe. And we consider them migrants, but we have a second type of migrants, which we never talk about. And these are the people who live in New York, who have no history there, but live there because it's close to Brussels and they commute to Brussels, highly skilled uh, people. And they are not integrated either. They live there because it's it's green, it's close to the big cities, it's because it's it's, a, it's the, the, the housing is LPG, they can buy big houses there. And they're, either, they're also migrants, and they're also not very much integrated. They have no interest in anyway. They live in the region. They don't live in the in the in the actual uh, municipality. So in that sense, social cohesion in this place is a myth. It's not. It's not there. It is imagined. However, these the second group of migrants, the kind of people that commute to Brussels and just live there, it's for them. It's a dormitory town. They're not really that much integrated. Um, but they're never problematized because they're rich and they don't need anyone else really. I mean, everything is catered for for them. Their schools and everything for. I mean, they they have a standardized life now, so uh, they're taken care of. They're never problematized. But they also are um, a, a challenge to the social cohesion that was once in these smaller villages. However, I think we conjure up the imagination of, of a kind of imagined community there through language, especially mm -hmm. in Inuva. Because Nino, Brussels is a French-speaking city in Dutch-speaking territory, and for the Dutch-speaking periphery of Brussels, the French language is is, a, is always seen as a threat, uh, and that has to do with the history of language. I'm not going to go into detail, but the irony is that most people that have a migration background have French as a second or third language, so they speak French quite fluently, and they come from Brussels because they migrated into Brussels, and then after a couple of years they sort of spread out, and because they speak French. They are seeing the same kind of threats of there are the French language guys again, and they will never learn Dutch because you know that's not what they do. And then they, they become an enemy because they, they kind of imagine the threat for this social cohesion, whereas they have nothing to do with this language problem. Absolutely nothing. It's not their problem, but it's made their problem because what then happens uh, is that in, because Nino is in the periphery of, of Brussels, but it's in Dutch speaking territory, there are very, very strict language rules. So if you communicate with the government, you have to speak Dutch. If you don't speak Dutch, you're not helped. You're not, you're not helped at all. And that's language law. But at the same time, it's even when people walk down the streets or in the railway area, where you traditionally have lots of, 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 uh, sort of migrant communities, what we hear from them is that we, we, if we don't speak Dutch, people look badly at us. Like it's a crime. You know, of course, you're, able, you're allowed to speak whatever language if you're in public space. There's no language rules. But it's seen as a sign of not willing to integrate. So in that sense, that's an imagined kind of social cohesion. It's dreamed up because you know it's language is seen as a kind of indicator whether you want to integrate or not. Whereas for the people that do that language, it has nothing to do with the ability to integrate, but not to speak language that's what is, is functional. So I agree with that. So even though I think the social cohesion is a myth, it is dreamed up and used in a way to, that is exclusionary to migrate. So what we learn from what you're saying is that migrants step into existing tensions and conflicts. Um, would you want to, to to add on this once we are like have our minds in the new world? Yes, uh, yes, very much so because uh, about the language issue. So um, one of the projects uh, is also a very political driven uh, team in the language. So um, one of the projects is about you know how do you uh, except as, for example, as um, when you have a client who's, who's not speaking Dutch, how do you help them? And so actually our personnel is quite unhappy about, uh, we cannot do our services, we cannot call people because we ha also have this, um, um, people who vote for the far right parties are actually controlling the other personnel. So there's some fear, there's some anxiety about what language should we speak and what, what can we do, what can, what can can we not do. Um, so I think it's um, for my role, it's about creating this um, sense of, um, yeah, it's like inform our personnel about this learning process as well. Not every, like 
I think uh, you touched this on this as well. Not everybody has the same background, so the learning uh, process of a language will never be the same. And that's also a perception that I think uh, the framing of being integrated somewhere, what is it about? Is it about, you know, the language? Is it, about, is it about the work? But actually, when you see that even when they try and they try to communicate, it's still not enough. You're still not integrated. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure where integration is actually, what is the meaning of it? So I think you, have, you need to have a vision about that first as well, but still about the topic. Um, yeah, so actually with our personnel, we had a, so we had a project um, for months we thought about, okay, how can we use them, um, <coughs> Google Translate apps, um, some, some visual, uh, instruments to help uh, to transfer the message and so on. So, but I think that during the process, the most important thing is that they try to understand um, or be empathetic, to become empathetic with the group of people who are coming. So I think that that's the most important thing. And that this issue about the language, we can turn it into something positive. We can let our personnel uh, know or uh, inform them better about yeah, the people who are arriving and who are in their situation. So I think you can take it as an advantage. They have a problem, uh, if you call it a problem, and then you get this um, language policy that you turn around and inform them well about the whole tragic uh, that they have. Mm -hmm. Great, that's the situation <laughs> where people come to stay. Yes. And you're working for, as you said, become empathetic about people arriving and, in, and include them, as uh, also Elizabeth said, to become a we. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I imagine a lot of the situations, if I got it right, uh, that you are dealing with, um, maybe are tricky in that respect because people come to move further. Uh, to maybe on the temporary labor markets engaged in seasonal jobs, etc. Uh, plus, you're in the rural area, so maybe municipalities are even more um, uh, as smaller, and and thus the, the level of social control may be higher. But I'm just guessing, and uh, I'd rather ask you. So, what what is your experience with building cohesion or handling conflicts? Uh, Okay. Um, I think it's a. I think the discussion was really being on on the significance of language. Mm -hmm. It's also relevant here, even more relevant here, because Greek is a different, difficult language, and you know, if you go to rural areas or to small towns, small towns, smaller sized towns, people don't know, they don't speak in English, so. So uh, it's a deal. Language is a deal. You go further and you are excluded. Uh, if you don't speak the language, and we uh, came across this uh, issue where they are uh, uh, people even for, who stay for many years in this, who haven't got, uh, were not so social, or working most of the time, not in places with uh, high sociability, so they didn't learn the language. Very well, so they feel excluded because they don't know the language. So the Italians uh, uh, people from uh, the Balkans, uh, yeah. uh, women mm -hmm. who do jobs in the, in the domestic sector, mm -hmm. they don't go out so often, mm -hmm. things like that. I mean, this also is an issue there. Um, I think it's a um, go back to the discussion on transit matters. Because we've got, and I think this issue has. Uh, present a lot of challenges in the case of Greece because it is the left and right wing have agreed that migrants do not have a good time in Greece and they have to go to another country for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Not because they don't believe the left wing party, they don't believe that they, um, they believe that uh, they can exercise their rights better in another country. And the, and the right wing are saying, okay, don't want them here. So I, I think it's, a, and that's why I think the current, the current uh, government, which is the right wing government, has been dominant. Its narrative is dominant because it touches upon this kind of, I would say, bottom line discussion. It's not that there is an agreement, okay? 
Uh, and sometimes I'm when I'm talking, I might think a bit provocative. Just excuse me. No? I'm not me. I don't mean that the left media, uh, left media that we in Greece are the same. But I'm saying that the, especially the issue of transit migration, this is a thorn in the, in the, in the, in the, on the side of the of, of discussion because it uh, um, encourages people to leave since they cannot have a good time in Greece. And so the issue there, the, the issue is remaining. The integration and in displacement and inclusion yeah, uh, in urban and rural areas. So I think um, also the, the I think the issue of integration and displacement is not a very popular issue in Greece. Okay. So that's why it's a, it is either silently downplayed or neglected by policymakers and policymakers. But it is the elephant in the room, okay. but it's not actually openly addressed. And that's the, I think that that's the main issue. And never mind what the local NGOs or national NGOs or some municipalities are willing to do, but this is left aside. That's in the public the public arena. I think I think there are two or three issues that I want to I will be very fast addressing. Uh, one is the issue of participation. Uh, I, I believe that informal processes in the case of Greece have been much more effective in getting people participating in the local level. And when there are official um, processes, official policies to be done, uh, they are not having the same effect because there is a backlash effect, because most of them are project-like uh, project interventions. So they don't have a long duration in the places that they are implemented. So I think that a follow-up is always is very important where in places where there are specific interventions to either to, um, I'll say, to resolve conflicts or to enable or to encourage people to be integrated and included, there should be a follow-up um, by the local authorities or regional authorities to make sure, to ensure but you don't have these backlash effects. Mm -hmm. but the backlash has to do with that those migrants and refugees, mostly refugees, are beneficiaries of the projects and they then forget that the local societies, and this should be underlined, are very much benefiting from camps. I'm not, not in favor of camps, but since camps are implemented, there are compensatory um, funding for yes. these camps. So this is not this is not acknowledged uh, that much, <laughs> and also it's not acknowledged that much. But when there are migrants and labor migrants in place, this means that there are employment opportunities. In most of the cases, both are set aside, and then the discussion starts that we, there are so many because there is the seasonal aspect, yes. and um, and I think there are a lot of contradictions around what participation might be. In specific places where there are not sustainable ways uh, all year round or in the long term. So I think this this kind of par paradoxes mm -hmm. need to be stressed in order not to have the idea that we can apply mm -hmm. policies in, in a lockdown perspective, whereas there are not national policies, speaking about Greece, <laughs> with long term effect at the local level. Yeah. So one more paradox, adding to others that we've heard before, uh, with people very engaged but having limited resources, strong civil society networks, but with low heterogeneity. So there's a lot of such ambivalences, obviously, uh, paradoxes. I'd like to leave the table now and uh, I look at to Eduardo, how much more can we use of the time uh, a quarter a quarter of an hour okay so we would now open the floor to comments or questions comments yes but keep in mind 15 more minutes altogether uh from the audience if there are one two okay <laughs> I'm from UK and I'm an immigration advisor. So in the UK, our NGOs, if you're working for NGO, you can provide free immigration advice. 
and you pass an exam and you are governed by an uh, independent organization called Office of Immigration Services Commissioner. I'm really interested to know if elsewhere in Europe there is such an equivalent uh, a free legal advice for immigrants. And if not, then um, is there another way of getting free legal advice for them? And who does that? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's take the second question as well. Hi, um, I'm Ayla Davies, I'm University of Chair as well. The poster just behind you in the yellow and blue. That's um, our research. Um, I was fascinated about the language uh, issue, which actually is reflected in this project and several other projects that we've done in the UK context. And there used to be interpretation services, and it's a common thing to have leaflets in multiple languages, depending on what the community is uh, in the locality. I was wondering whether something like that exists in other countries. What does language support or access is there in general? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, curious to about the first question, will there be someone saying, yeah, we have free legal advice in our country? Whereas, uh, okay, uh, second question, maybe language support. Everybody has a story to tell. So, okay, so you're saying yes, days. Uh, yeah, the legal advice we have like this agency uh, of our region planners, um, the agency of integration and uh, integration and interpreting, but I don't know how to translate them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there you can actually have um, free legal advice about your passport, about the procedures um, and so on. So uh, yeah, it's actually very- Is it government? Yeah, it, yeah it's government. Part of the it's, government. Yes, yes. So you can ask any question there um, and it's part of your program, but you can also just ask questions if you're not following the integration program. So it's for everybody uh, and it's free. So I'm not much sure how well it is known by the people. So that's a different question, uh, but it is there. So I think that it's up to us, municipalities and social services to al also be the bridge person and take the information for your clients or let them, letting them know where they can find it. So yeah, that's another topic. But maybe we could together sort out what there is in Germany, because I think that would be the option to, to go for legal advice. But then again, the question who knows about that is, is important. And there are so many NGOs or voluntary initiatives trying to support with these legal issues. Mm -hmm. um, Elisabeth needs to. Okay, <laughs> then, then do you, do you like to. No, no I, I, to you? yeah, okay. No, uh, we also have that in Germany, and uh, we have a lot of projects, migrant projects, also co coordinating those kind of legal advices. Like in Berlin, you have mm -hmm. Kontaktstelle, they do a lot of legal counseling, and uh, it's not just Berlin, even other areas. So it's possible. One other issue is the, uh, yeah. The information who knows about it. Is that government but, value? Yes, yeah. sometimes yeah. sponsored by a um, project sponsored from the government. So, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I comment on language. Maybe yes, please. Okay. <laughs> I think language is um, very important if you want to look at language and access and language and denial. You have people who know the language, they are still being denied of uh, certain issues, certain mm -hmm. access to places. So I don't think language in this case is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, language would be um, a problem of access and not uh, a problem of not knowing the language. Because you have migrants who speak perfect German, I will use the case of Germany, but they still don't have access to certain programs or they still don't have access to the municipality. They are not part of the advisory board and something like that. And then you have people who don't know the language, but on the other side, they have information uh, material for in different languages. So you can always have information in maybe your language of origin and most often English, French, German, Arabic, and 
um, yeah, sometimes in other African languages like tree and so, and so on. So you have that possibility, but it's also important to emphasize the access of language plus and denial and language and access. Yeah, is a rule in integration. Yeah. In Belgium, we also have an education service, but it's also governmental, but you have to uh, sign a contract as, for example, an organization, as an NGO or uh, a public service. You have to sign a contract and it's also not free. So then you have, uh, you have to need to have permission of your um, politicians. And that's very also a topic uh, of discussion, like who's, why do you need to pay for this, that they should uh, pay for it. So you get this like really black and white uh, conversation about these education services. So we do have it as a municipality, but you don't have maybe 15 or even five kilometers further, the municipality does not have a contract. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's also a very personal uh, subjective decision to yeah. have or not have the services. So, and you have to have budget for it. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's also difficult. Uh, so, and also the client, uh, I suppose, or the citizen cannot, um, yeah, have contact uh, themselves with the service. So it needs to be an organization that is providing you that. So it depends on whether you do it or not. So we're back at the question of capacities. You want to yeah. something? Yes, I would like to add something. And um, as for the legal advice, it's provided by NGOs voluntarily. I don't. I'm not sure. Probably there are, there are some uh, there are some service at the municipal level of, um, um, uh, but uh, I don't. I think big cities. Uh, I would expect that NGOs uh, provide this in the case of this. It's not government supported most of the time. It's on project basis. But uh, for translation or cultural mediation, things like that in public um, service, and it's discontinued. It's not always there. It depends. And I wanted to add something here that we've uh, had experience, for example, in one or sometimes in public hospitals, especially the irregular migrants. I'm not speaking about refugees because refugees are somehow, somehow, not totally supported because there is funding, or used to be up to now in the case of Greece. But for irregular migrants, if they, if they happen to have an accident and go to the hospital, the hospital, most of, in most of the cases, especially the hospitals outside the departments in Salonika and Patras, which are the major cities, uh, in the hospitals, they are supposed to have translation, but it's not always in place mm -hmm. from Bangladeshi or from other. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, noticed that people who, and their compatriots play this role of intermediaries and they offer this kind of services. So this kind of these networks, informal networks, that's why it, it, and I stress these informal networks because they make their life easier. Net networks of their compatriots of people of the wider migrant community is there to support them and make some provisions in terms uh, with the price sometimes, not always, uh, to, for, to, to help them or to, to include them in the local society, which is important, I think, yeah. and it's uh, in the lack of, of the of official state. Of the, of the, of the mm -hmm. But at least they have hospitals. I mean, I know small they towns have, at the town. They have access to <laughs> in the case of this, they have access to public hospitals. So yeah. this is a thing which is not. Um, Negotiate. It's one of the positive aspects. Right. Yeah. 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 Of course, for Nicole, it was uh, Italy has this crazy system. Uh, you know, uh, Roberta was talking about that yesterday. Actually, the many rights uh, are not attached to what I mean, speakers or refugees, but uh, uh, are attached to the place where, <laughs> where they are located. <laughs> Then, uh, if they end up uh, in the ordinary uh, reception system, they are provided with uh, legal advice uh, and uh, cultural uh, mediation and, and whatever. Uh, if they end up in governmental facilities, 
it depends. I mean, legal advice is there, but maybe there are four hours of legal advice for uh, 50, a week for uh, 50 persons that, of course, uh, that they, are, they are not prepared to, to, to go in front of the commission or the other place. Um, then it, it depends. Uh, I mean, the, the situation is very heterogeneous because uh, those rights, uh, yeah, are not individual rights, uh, but uh, they are regulated by uh, yeah, the, the, the regulation, the norms, uh, the laws uh, uh, concerning the facilities. Then, uh, yeah, the situation is very diverse, of course. We will have room for one last question. If somebody wants to. Okay, yes, please. Uh, thank you. I'm Raja Khan from the Netherlands. I like this poster over here. <laughs> Blue and uh, yellow. And I'm focusing on the EU uh, migrants. So they're from the EU. They're usually uh, Polish, uh, Romanian, uh, Latvian, Lithuanian. Uh, and those people don't want to be integrated. So uh, those also don't have time to go to legal advisors because they work all the time. So I'm struggling with the question, what can municipality please do for those people uh, if they you know, need help? And, and they're not going to ask for help because there's no time. They, they work. Uh, and, and then they sleep. And then they work. And we have in my village in the, in the Netherlands that a hotel with a lot of Polish people uh, around the corner. That's how I came up with the idea to, to immerse myself in this topic. Um, and I see there's a lot of hostility in our village towards this hotel. Um, and I'm, it's just a question for you. What, what do you think that is the most important thing to, to uh, let these people realize they have workers' rights and, and that actually the EU should protect them for um, Again, uh, exploitation. Well, I think it's like I think it's also a common problem, but it is the EU policy. I mean, this is the reason why we have the European Union as a free trans, uh, traffic, so they uh, are not um, obligated to have this integration. So somewhere it starts there, so we cannot change that. I think, uh, but if you really try to, because we have the same. Problems and you have also the seasonal um, employees who just come and go all the time, and then you just don't even know who is actually living in your uh, in your town. But I think if you have like this centralized place, like you say, it's a hotel, so maybe you can uh, go and reach out to them, so you can have, let them know that there is somebody, or maybe like a buddy who maybe you say it's a lot of uh, Eastern European countries, so maybe someone who has a bit of uh, uh, knowledge about their culture or language that just can be like, you know, I'm here. If you want me, uh, I can I answer some question, questions or just spend some time at the building. Maybe there is a, a space where they can just sit and provide information between on some days so that they really get to know this person and gain their trust. It was also about gaining trust the other day. I think it's a very important thing to have. And I think it kind of stops there. But um, yeah, I think reaching out to them with a rich person, you know, the buddy would be a first step. Maybe somebody in the building is actually um, strong enough to, to become that person, to um, centralize the questions and get them to you or something in that kind of way. Yeah, that's how I think. Can I add just two sentences? In, in the beginning of the migration to Western Europe in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, trade unions played a very important role in the guest labor programs and integration. I think they should play back that role. <laughs> they should play back that role then. Oh, to just the trade unions. Ah, yeah. 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 They are no longer present in this integration policy mm -hmm. because it's so much about culture and language and so on. Mm -hmm. And they should play back that role mm -hmm. because it's about labor market migration. <laughs> no, uh, about that, it's a crucial issue. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, we are, I mean, uh, we are working with the fights in our region for for doing two different things. Uh, one is uh, using uh, outreach in uh, social workers, and the other is to move services in 
neutral places uh, attended by migrants. Then, I mean, services and to get off from their offices. Yeah. I think that is crucial. Mm -hmm. They can't stay there, there and wait in mm -hmm. uh, beneficiaries, clients, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. They have to go outside and look for them where they are. And it, 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 I think it's true both for uh, migrant people, but also for uh, native people, especially after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because it, it, yeah, it was a turning point. And older people. Yeah. And older people, yeah. Older people, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's not a migrant specific problem, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe on, the, <laughs> maybe on the issue of hostility, I mean, what is often missing in the discussion is the positive aspect of migration. You know, those people are there, they are working for the community, and I think uh, it should be reported that they are not just there to disrupt the social setting, they are there to work, and they are there to make that community grow. So we should also um, show the positive side of migration because migration is often described as a negative uh, concept which scares people from people who look different so we should always encourage the you know the, the positive effects and the positive the good things that um, migrants do for the community mm -hmm. yeah so we stop this discussion <laughs> with the notion of the need for advocacy and the need to point to the positive effect, which is very good. And this is where I hand over to Eduardo to close our session. Yeah. So uh, I did not say much, but thank you for coming. Uh, because uh, it, it was not so expected, uh, because we just launched a, a call and uh, much more people than we expected reacted, not only from academic networks we are in, uh, but also from people that we just uh, knew uh, from what they write or uh, uh, from common uh, disciplinary area, but not only, and also from civil society organizations, which was one uh, of our goal, being this uh, an AMIF project, so not a research project, and we aim to put together uh, uh, research and policy. And uh, I think that uh, we got some good ideas and points to work on, both from the academic part and from the uh, policy debate part and how to uh, keep the, the, the things together and we will continue discussion. We are half of our project, we have still uh, one, uh, one year. Uh, so uh, I hope we can uh, meet again for the final event, which will be next February in Belgium. We have still to decide where, I suppose. Yes, if it's Brussels or Antwerp, no. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, we will have our final uh, event uh, in Belgium next uh, February. And uh, please follow the updates from our project to our uh, media channels, and so the website and uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And thanks to Federico, who could not be here. Uh, but is uh, just live blogging everything <laughs> we did from home <laughs> and so <laughs> thanks uh, thanks Benedico and uh, uh, that's it thank you very much for uh, uh, for uh, for coming and for uh, this such fruitful discussion uh, we had and we hope we can go on further uh, with that okay. Thank <laughs> you.